and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and the interior of your car is so clean. How do you keep it that clean? Very tidy person. That's what I think. If you look up at the night sky on a clear evening, you can see about 2,000 stars. I can see about 2,500 because I eat a lot of carrots. You can see about 2,000. That's just a fraction of the stars in our galaxy, which number somewhere between 100 billion and 400 billion. Let's say there are 200 billion stars in our galaxy. Now let's take a conservative estimate of how many of those might have sun-like stars, and then take a fraction of those, just 1%, that might have life, and then just a fraction of those that might have intelligent life. After taking a sliver of a sliver of a conservative estimate of the amount of stars that have planets, we're still left with 10,000 intelligent species that ought to inhabit our galaxy. Now consider that our planet is relatively young and girlish, a mere 4.5 billion years old. But as you get closer to the galactic core, stars and planets get much older, upwards of 12 billion years old. So presumably, if there is other intelligent life in our galaxy, some of it is much, much older and more advanced than we are, even Canada. And that begs a rather troubling question, doesn't it? If there are 10,000 intelligent species in the galaxy, and lots of them are literally millions of years more advanced than us, how come none of them are listening to my podcast? Or if they are, how come they aren't leaving reviews? To temporarily divorce me from this equation, another question might be, why haven't aliens swung by Earth to say hello and be neighborly? Or how come we're not picking up their awesome sitcoms by now? That notion, that if there are thousands upon thousands of aliens out there, why don't we know about them, is what's known as Fermi's Paradox, and it's what my producer Jennings and I are going to talk about today. But before we do that, we do have to pay those bills, and that means a word from our sponsor. Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is brought to you by... Invisible Car Keys from Wunderkim Industries. If you're like me, you're sick and tired of people stealing your car. Whether it's sneaky neighborhood kids, a wayward valet, or just your run-of-the-mill car thief, people steal my car three or four times a week. I've done everything I can to keep people from stealing my car. I leave a note on the dashboard that says, please don't steal my car. Sometimes I even call my more suspicious friends. Specifically, Evan Sims. And out of the blue, I'll just say, you better not be thinking about stealing my car, friendo. Fortunately, there's a great new product on the market, invisible car keys. They're like regular car keys, only they're completely transparent. Like little pieces of jingly glass. Sure makes it hard for a sneaky old Evan to steal my car keys when he can't find them. Now that said, if you're like me, you sometimes forget where you set your invisible car keys. Did I leave them on the dresser, maybe on the couch? Where are those things? Well, in that case, you can purchase a strobing neon keychain that will help you spot those pesky transparent keys. Just attach your strobing neon keychain and you'll be able to spot those keys from an acre away. Invisible car keys from Wunderkim Industries, the industry leader in hiding car keys. My guest today is a man about town, man's man, ladies' man, friend to all dogs, producer of my show, 2008 times person of the year. Was that right? I can't remember which deck, which was the year that they gave it to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> was Whatever it 2008? Was. Yeah. It was a, there was a lot of different things. The, the man, the myth, the legend. Josh Jennings, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Did you have to travel far to get here? I sure did. I walked all the way across the hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. It's not uh, easy to do. I, I am excited to talk to you about the Fermi Paradox. This is one of my favorite topics. This is like, this is my favorite. Yeah, mine too. This is my favorite topic. Um, it happens less now that I'm in my 30s, but like come 1 a.m. when you're at the party and about like a third of the people have left and you're like, have a drink, I want to talk to you about something. This is, <laughs> but what I'm saying, gentlemen, is this is the deal closer, <laughs> is uh, bring this one up to prove how, how smart you are. But like the Fermi Paradox, I'm honestly kind of freaked out by it because the first time I encountered it, I was like, oh, I had, I'd always just, I hadn't really thought about it. And I, I just sort of assumed that there was a kind of Star Trek universe out there where we're all more or less climbing out of the ooze within a 300 year period of one another. Uh, and, uh, and then when you get to thinking about it, no, if, if there are intelligent species, then there are 
presumably intelligent species that have been around a couple billion years, and they're not swinging by to say hi. And that's kind of disturbing to me. So I'm, the, I'll tell you my fear with it, um, because there, there's a theory called the great filter theory. And the idea is that there's, there's some cataclysmic event that just naturally happens in every civilization where either the point at which we can develop atomic weapons, just every civilization blows itself up, right. or the point at which you can develop Cylons, all the Cylons <laughs> turn into hot platinum blondes and kill everybody. Uh, or maybe which is honestly probably the best way to which go. Which is if we were uh, if we were going to pick a way to go, right? A hundred percent. I'd want there to be hot Cylons living <laughs> on the moon or something. Um, but it does make me th see. That's that's my fear with this scenario is that it's basically the the absence of evidence is an indication that evolution, in the same way that ev every human culture will eventually develop the wheel, if if given enough resources and time, every sentient uh, civilization eventually blows itself up. That's my fear. Are you worried? Uh, I'm not particularly. Um, I, I, I've given a lot of thought to the Fermi paradox, and I actually um, found some. I, I, have, I found some some rather comforting news, which is that uh, the Fermi paradox is probably neither Fermi's nor a paradox. Uh, which I'll get to that in a second. Wait, hold on. If it's not Fermi's <laughs> paradox, I don't feel any better. If it's Bob's paradox, I'm like, oh, it's Bob. Yeah, Bob's full of crap. I don't care now. But that's just it. Bob's an idiot. I'm not worried if if an idiot thinks that that uh, we have an empty universe. Uh, I'm a little more worried if somebody like Enrico Fermi thinks that we have an empty universe. Bob's a chump. Go on. Bob is a chump. Yeah. <laughs> Screw Bob. Yeah. Um, Unsubscribe to my podcast, Bob. That's you know who right. You are. We don't need you. Um. But anyway, to go back to to go back to your your question, I'll I'll come back to that in a second. Um, I I do think that uh, that that something in what you're saying there is worth noting, which is that uh, we only have our civilization to go on. We only have it for for purposes of comparison. And Belgium. I mean, if you want to count them as a civilization, yeah, shots fired, <laughs> I, Brussels. I guess they gave us waffles, sort yeah, of. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, to go back to, to, the, to the paradox itself, uh, first of all, um, as I understand it, and I think there are multiple different versions of this story, so, you know, uh, take this with a grain of salt. Um, the conversation in question that everybody always references uh, about Enrico Fermi and, and, and friends uh, is Which that- was a great sitcom. It was great a variety great variety show. Coming right after Carol Burnett, yeah. as I recall, Enrico Fermi. Yeah. And it was great until they until they added the laugh track. And yeah, the, that was terrible. It was just, just hokey. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the the conversation supposedly did indeed take place, and Enrico Fermi did indeed say at some point, "Where where is everybody?" Mm. Um, which probably we should outline that part for the listeners who are not familiar with the uh, Fermi paradox, uh, which is that supposedly. Um, Enrico Fermi and a group of other uh, physicists were were talking at lunch one day, and uh, someone had seen a a cartoon of an alien uh, coming out of a spaceship, and they started talking about the possibilities of ex uh, extraterrestrial life. And uh, by the way, this is like 1950, so this wasn't uh, as as big of a thing in in, in the public consciousness as it is now. Uh, but uh, apparently, Enrico Fermi at some one point spoke up and said, "Where is everybody?" And the maybe myth that follows that is that from there he postulated what's known as the Fermi paradox, mm -hmm. which is is so essentially why haven't all these civilizations come by to say hello right or any of them be neighborly not not just all of them any, any of, of them. them why have yeah. none of them yeah space belgians swinging by to space give belgians. us space waffles <laughs> uh so uh it's according to what i've read that didn't actually happen uh the fermi paradox as we know it today uh, is a combination of, of uh, observations by Michael Hart in 1975 and Frank Tipler in 1980. I am. Um, I feel no way better. <laughs> well, I'm just throwing it out. No, there. but that's good. I'm glad. Uh, I'm, no, I'm glad. I'm more doing... inclined to 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 look at the reasons why it's not a paradox. Okay. Uh, and why I don't think it's Ooh, even you're getting meta. I like that. Yeah, I don't even think it's a viable. Now, um, can I? So I'm, I want to pause you because I don't want. I I want to build up the suspense. Because I've got Fair my enough. I've got my conclusion to this. I know you've got your conclusion to this. So let's walk through some of the scenarios first, and then at the end of it, okay. you and I will will put out what our what our theories are. So Fermi's paradox. Uh, to again, just to reiterate what it is, it's basically the idea that if 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 intelligent life can arise in the universe, there should be a bunch of it, and it should be older than us. And so why haven't we talked to it yet? That's weird. That's 
me putting a cap on it. So there's there's kind of maybe four broad categories for why this could happen. And this is a fun, I think, a fun mental exercise to go through. So I've already mentioned the great filter theory. And that's the, um, and I, I went through two specific scenarios, the awesome Cylon theory, where uh, platinum blondes uh, that are just smoking uh, become the dominant form of life. Again, the favored way to go. Yeah, favored way to go. Uh, the other one is that we, we nuke ourselves, in which case, uh, maybe we're okay. Maybe, maybe the moment that should have, you know, killed all of human civilization was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Maybe, maybe we got through it. If, if, in theory, if every civilization gets to that nuclear breaking point, there should eventually be one civilization that breaks the mold where they've got a a, a moon that doesn't have uranium on it, and there's a sure. bunch of astronauts that are stranded there. So there might be some civilizations able to break it. There's another possibility as well that the Great Filter, this this event that stops intelligent civilizations from happening, actually happens very early. It could be that. Uh, life develops with some regularity on other planets, but that that jump from unicellular to Belgian uh, is very, very unlikely. Th- and, Thag is is carving a stone rock one day, and the next day he finds plutonium. Right. <laughs> the, 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 or, yeah, or, yeah, maybe it's that. Maybe, maybe that they're like we get, you know, we get to the level of chimps, we get to the level of apes, but it's just very unlikely. So that that's a possibility. But most of the most of the great filter theories are disturbing because most of the great sure. filter theories are are they they would indicate that we're due. Or that we will be, yeah. and that and that when we're dead, no one's coming to come find our cool stuff. We're just dead, right? So it's that's the most dark. Of and the by th- the way, that part is the thing that I that I fear. I'm not terribly afraid that the uh, that the universe is empty. Uh, that that I don't think that's probably the case. Uh, I do worry a bit that our our you know, self-destructive tendencies as a species. I'm going to sound like a, like a Roddenberry liberal here. Uh, our self-destructive tendencies as a species may outpace our technological advancements to the point that we, that we do destroy ourselves before we can uh, colonize Mars or mm. we can move out into the, out into the which uh, cosmos. In, in, in which case we'd, we'd appear to be in that, you know, stress period right now because we have nukes. We do. Yeah. And, the, and uh, nukes are definitely yeah, a there's, there's very a worrisome thing. thing. To, to put it on a, a, potentially better note though if we get out of the, the 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 great filter theory there's an idea that there are a ton of civilizations out there let's again like the most conservative estimate would be about 10,000 we're going with the 1% the 1% kind of stuff sure. that they're they're dark so it could be um, uh, Stephen Hawking before he died said that he thought it was a very bad idea to try and reach out and broadcast our location to other civilizations because we don't know who they are and right. it, it was kind of his position that uh, it, that would be like, you know, the, the, the people in the Yucatan Peninsula trying to make contact with Spain. Maybe don't raise attention to the gold we have or whatever it is. And so, but the but the Spanish brought them Christianity and and yeah, and smallpox and all sorts of other things. Yeah, there's lots of things that they brought them. They were very kind. Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll throw out real quick, like that is one thing that I don't have a lot of traction for when I get into science fiction is I, I like the, the Independence Day conceit that uh, civilization would have the ability to travel the galaxy, but then needs to come to Earth for like ten or something is just to me mind-bogglingly bad economics. Like right. that, that would be like the equivalent of. Um, we found petroleum on Mars, so we're going to try to get to Mars so that Halliburton can drill for petroleum. Like the the amount of money that you need to get there, just it wouldn't make any logical sense. But maybe, maybe they weren't coming for ten, though. I mean, they never specified. Maybe it was like they have Dairy Queen. That's yeah, could be yeah. Um, but th- but there's this this dark theory, and so in that one, like, and, and this one's more optimistic because it could be it could be the one that just uh, all these civilizations that they basically get to the Stephen Hawking level of brilliance and go, we should shut the f up. Right. And just not broadcast our location because we don't know what's out there. So it could be that that happens naturally. It could be that they just have super good porn or something else. I'm, I'm putting a funny hat on it, but th- there is a theory that basically when a civilization gets intelligent enough, that that civilization like develops the matrix. Maybe they have non-murderous Cylons. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> right. So they're like, why would I go around the galaxy? I got my, my Cylon buddies here, one of whom's a, a nine foot tall blonde model. Uh, could be. So it could, it could be that basically like we, we get to that, that civilizations, this is sort of like the positive corollary to the great filter, that we get to a point where uh, we, we can make our own universe that's so cool that we just don't want to go out uh, beyond. We, we don't want to win only the house. We're in our pajamas. Right. We're in our Snuggie. Uh, we're, we're, we, we've got the electric right. blanket. We've got Netflix. We don't want to leave the house, right? It's, it's the great quilter. The great quilter. Theory. Oh, that's great. The great. I am writing that down, Jennings. The great quilter. You just got yourself a Nobel Prize. Um, and, and then I suppose that like a, probably another variant of that would be the prime directive. 
right. which would be that there is some sort of galactic intelligence, whether it's connected or not, but that there's sort of an acknowledgement that they're not that there's some sort of quarantine state that we're put into. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are all plausible. Well, I think that they are. They're interesting. Whether the like, the, the plausibility again. I, I think that given that we only have our own species to go on and our own ability to um, to formulate an idea of what a civilization of beings would even look like, what that structure would look like, would it necessarily form in the same way ours would, or even in trying to imagine one that doesn't form itself in the way that ours has – we're we're still just kind of I think mostly producing uh, negative images, mm. uh, not negative as in bad. Negative as in no, like the reverse, re- the mirror images of, of ours, yeah, yeah, inverted images of Earth. So um, I think I, I think that's very limiting. Uh, much like the idea of of you know we're going to take the one percent of the one percent uh, and and use that as our possibility. I understand you have to do that for. Uh, you know, the purposes of, of, of trying to come up with something semi-realistic. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we, we have no idea. We don't even really, we have no idea how life started here. Hmm. We, we really don't. No, you, uh, the, you, you raise a really good point. And this is, uh, having not been thinking, I probably, I stumbled onto the Fermi Paradox maybe four years ago. So mm-hmm. I've, and I haven't been thinking about it consistently for the last four years. It's, but, it's literally all you talk about. It's all I talk about. I just talk about this in Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, but but I, I think, right, because there, there, are, there are so many um, assumptions that are built into it that, that it's, it's virtually impossible to unpack because we can't see what it's like uh, outside of us. So like one example, and it's just, this was occurring to me earlier, um, I, I'm, the Fermi Paradox is, is we're explaining it. I am assuming that uh, life happens naturally at some point, and, and then eventually it might turn into a, a civilization which is intelligent. What if there's some factor we're unaware of? For example, let's say that it took about 12 billion years of the cosmos existing before cosmic brain rays were just emitted everywhere. And we can't detect cosmic brain waves because we don't have the technology. Or but, we can, and they look like dark energy to right. us. Right, but, there, but yeah. there, were, there was some factor that we are unaware of, right? Sure, in yeah. which In which case, then the whole equation changes, because at that point, we might be the first civilization. And it, it, may, it may just be that it, we, there, there's some factor we're unaware of. We're only, like, there's, what, 18 dimensions or whatever, where we're of five sure. in Netflix? So, like, like the, the, you know, it could be that we don't know them. So that's entirely possible. Um, uh, there, there are, uh, and I, that goes into like a whole other category of the Fermi paradox, which is that it's possible that there are civilizations they've not gone dark, they've not blown themselves up, but we have no idea how to communicate with them. Right. Where we're are we're, we're like 2019. We're like huh, clearly the telegraph machine is like you know how every civilization would communicate. We've 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 thrown out our line to the world. And we're like where, where's the Morse code? I'm not hearing any Morse code here. And it turns out the rest of the universe is all super intelligent space whales, right. and they all communicate through <laughs> you know uh, some kind of Wi-Fi telepathy. And they're just screaming at us. They're like, please stop with the Kardashians. We're sick of this garbage. We just want to hear podcasts, but we can't hear them. So we're we're going out there going. Uh, I I can't. I, there's nothing here. But in, in reality, we're bombarded with it we're just completely unaware of it sure so so i i came up with a few uh, possibilities as well i i think um periodically over millions of years of space travel um you're gonna get lost so like uh i think i think it's entirely possible it, when you when you develop this subset of of like well if if um i think the par- the, the fermi paradox addresses um if there was a civilization that had x amount of time even traveling, I forget if it's at sublight speeds or or just at light speed, <clears throat> how long it would take them to to basically visit everywhere in the universe, yeah. and um, and then the assumption from that is well, since that hasn't happened, you know, then they're maybe they're not out there. Uh, I think you have to take into account multiple things, like people are going to get lost, like Steve falls asleep at the wheel. The point at which their light speed, I think they get lost. Like, I feel like they'd pro- probably have pretty good star charts at that point. You would think, but maybe, I mean, things will happen. The, the other bomb thing is, charge. you're talking about, yeah, yeah. Then Bob, you're really space screwed. Bob's the worst. <coughs> yeah, Space, space Bob. Bob's got his map to Disney World. He's getting lost circling <laughs> Disney or circling Dairy Queen all the time. But I think, I think you could you also, I mean, we're talking generational ships. Again, assuming that this is life- the, that lives, you know, a similar amount of time to us, um, it's generational. If you had to do what your father had done before you 
and he had to do what his father had done before him. Okay, yeah. I mean, don't you think at some point down the road you're going to be like, you know what? I'm going to fly this starship into a sun. Have, have you read Dust? Have you read that novel? I don't think so. Uh, so I won't. Uh, I, I'll make this as quick as I can, but it's a really good novel. And it, it begins with there is an, a, like a, a nuclear silo. We don't know where it is. Neither do the people in it. And it's like a multi-generational nuclear silo. And they can, they can see, they've got cameras. They can see the landscape around them, which is all nuclear waste. And there's just this mention in the first chapter that at some point there'd been an uprising in this, in this particular apocalyptic silo that had destroyed all the records. And as a result, no one knows how long they've been down there. Like they've oh, got, wow. they've got a guess, but like something like that could conceivably happen. You're right. If there, if there were going to be a bunch of multi-generational ships where like, you know, maybe they don't fly into the sun, but like there is some kind of like, you know, the, or, the Wi-Fi yeah. goes out or yeah. something. Or, 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 I mean, they decide to, they decide to go to war with other, other right. civilizations yeah. or they, they decide, you know, uh, this 50 planet grouping is the most that I can handle. And so we're going to settle in here because this is plenty. You've got like a Dunbar's us. number. Where yeah, like, like, yeah. Like space whales can There's have just, up to 30,000 contacts, but after so, that, they don't want any more. There are so many permutations yeah. uh, of, of available possibilities. And well, and the biggest thing, uh, by the way, the, the, this is my last one. The biggest enemy, I think, of space exploration, hands down, is bureaucracy. Hmm. Bureaucracy, if it works anything like it works here in any other civilization, it's going to be like, oh yeah, we built, we developed Starfleet, but eighty percent of our ships are currently on loan for the Klingon Pride to Parade. It, like, it's not, we're not. Have, have you seen Red Dwarf? I have seen. That's a, that's that's a, a shout out to the British it. listeners. Yes, there, there's, very much. There's, there's an episode where because um, <laughs> the the premise is that this basically this guy is put in cryogenic freezing. It's a uh, Craig Kil or Craig uh, Ferguson was in that show. Was he? Yeah, I didn't know that. very young Craig Ferguson. He um he in, in the sh I did not know that. Yeah. He uh, in, in the show the the main character is is put in like uh, cryogenic freezing or whatever, and everyone else in the ship's killed by radiation, and he wakes up like you know a, a, a thousand years later, but he's got a hologram buddy, and at one point the hologram guy. It's talking to him, and he, and he realizes they hadn't paid his taxes. And, uh, and the caller was like, what do you care? Like, Earth's been dead for a thousand years. And he's like, that's not going to stop the tax service. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that, no. He's like, I've, I've had, like, oh, this is, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna reveal my inner dork here. Jennings has seen the inner dork a number of times, but but I don't know that the audience has. I like I, I like having daydreams. I have, like, um, sure. like I have, like, maybe four or five set daydreams that I will just do on, like, whenever I'm jogging. And one of them is uh, that for whatever, oh, for whatever reason, aliens come down. Is this going to involve Cylons? No, it won't involve Cylons. No, I'm not telling you anything about that fantasy. Um, but uh, no, in this fantasy, like, aliens come down and they're like, hey, Andrew Heaton, come meet us at this park. And I'm like, oh. And in this fantasy, I always bring my passport because I'm like, there's probably some bureaucrat on that ship that's got to stamp my friggin' passport. So I've always, like, I've always got, even in my fantasy, I've got to do that. I, I want to back up a little bit to the uh, the the earlier point that I, I think you make a very good point on, which is that uh, we're only operating off of our understanding of civilization. We could be wrong about it. So if we go back to this idea that a civilization could be a billion years older than us, which is so hard to comprehend, if if we were the equivalent of kitchen ants in Patrick Stewart's kitchen, like Patrick Stewart doesn't care. He, like, it's, he, it, it, it's it's further apart than that, right? It would. I mean, you think yeah. about like like if if you, you yeah you think about what a billion years. I mean, it could be that they're like that there there's some megastructure, some qu like multi dimensional megastructure that we're just completely unaware of, and they, they don't care about us. We don't care about them, right? Uh, and like like let's hope that they're not going to like you know install a blender or something. If you want to go really weird, I think it's possible. Not saying I think this is likely. I think it's possible that. Uh, that interstellar bodies may have some sort of of uh, distributed intelligence. It, it's it, it sounds so they're, wacky. They're, no, they'd be like neurons. Like, like yeah. so, like like light. Like basically, light would be like like photon packets. Would be like neur neuron bursts. It's, it's possible. possible. Yeah. Yeah. In, in which case, the galaxy. If would you be were an atom inside of a human brain, you'd mm -hmm. have no idea that anything was going on other than just neurons moving yeah. around. Interesting, yeah, and so yeah. so there could be intelligent, like macro intelligence, absolutely, which yeah. uh, which makes sense. I mean, like my my gut fauna has no idea what I think about 
Patrick Stewart. Yours might, but everybody else's my, doesn't. Mine might. My, my gut <laughs> Yours, fauna. Your gut I've, fauna is very well aware I've of Patrick Stewart. I've said it often Stewart. enough now that the gut fauna is like, oh my God, we get it. He's a knight that was on Star Trek. Oh, we just want to digest this bagel. Uh, yeah, I think that's possible. And like a couple other scenarios that are possible. One that we, we've, uh, two, two that we've glanced over. Um, one is that we actually, the, the Fermi paradox is, is not a paradox because aliens have made uh, constant contact with us and the government has, has not done it or has not let us know. That's a possibility. Yeah. I, I think an unlikely one. This is where my my inner cynic of, of government f- efficacy comes up. Right. Where yeah. I'm just like, I think it would like, I feel the same way about the moon landing. I think I feel like it would be so much easier to go to the moon than to have that many bureaucrats lie about it for that one. Right. Yeah. Um, and I actually, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but if not, I'll make it as quick as I can. But uh, I, I've met... Uh, Buzz Aldrin twice. Right. And the second time I asked him what he thought about intelligent life. And he had, I think, the same position that we have, which is that statistically it's an almost virtual certainty that there is intelligent life out there. But um, if it were contacting Earth, it would require a conspiracy of every government to not talk about it, at which point I piped up even France, because I feel like (laughs) France would eventually want to make us feel bad. And the fact that France hasn't done that to make us feel bad um, is an indication that that's not there. And then the other Plus, I I trust I trust Julian Assange. And uh, there's no question (laughs) he would have let us know. He would let us know. Yeah, good point. Uh, And then then the other the other possibility which you haven't brought up is that um, it could uh, there could be a a religious capacity here or a a religious element to this where uh, maybe God exist, created the universe, and we are the only intelligent life in all of it because it requires an act of God. In which case, I'll, I'll say like, if we, if I'm around here 20,000 years from now, and we are the only species in the entire galaxy, I think I would go, I'm pretty sure then that there had to be some kind of maker behind it because the odds are so odd that we're the only one right. that, uh, that, that, that that happened, that there, there might be some intelligent design behind this. Uh, yeah. So it, it, if it turns out we're not in an, you know, in a uh, simulation, if, uh, if if it isn't the case that beyond say the realm of our uh, solar system all the stars are just you know digital projections that we're seeing you know that are there for our own benefit or something like that um i i do think that uh it's very weird to think um from a, from like take it from a theistic point of view for a moment let's say god creates the whole universe and only puts life on earth in the span of time that we're going to be here, whatever that is, whether it's 10,000 years, a billion years, it's one, uh, it's it's unlikely that we're going to get branch out and, and explore the entire universe. I mean, the universe is expanding. We have to take that into account. Yeah. And we, we're not in this whole podcast. We've not even mentioned other galaxies of which there are. Many. Oh, yeah. there's a lot of them. Yeah. There's over 12. There's at least at least 13. I think yeah, yeah, they yeah, discovered yeah, a new one. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, if that's the case, why, why is it out there? Why did he create it? I mean, those stars don't look that different from the more local stars. He loves swirls. He (laughs) He really loves swirls. That's people don't know that. He just loves swirls. What's the point? Why, why have a, a universe that, that is expanding outward that is, that is so vast we can't even begin to really grasp it. Um, if you're yeah, not, no, you, if you're, you're not going to people it with a, 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 you know, put other life. You out raised there. a good point, but you actually you raised a, another good point, which is I think the, that's the, that's really all I do is raise yeah, good thank points. You. The um, you you mentioned simulation, which I think is another alternative to the the Fermi paradox, which is that uh, we are actually living in a simulation, and uh, this would this would require a, another drink and another conversation. But um, there are a lot of smart people who think that we're living in a computer simulation, and uh, the the quickest way to do this, I think, is to to say, let's say that a proper quantum computer is made. Right now, the computer that you're listening to this on via, via your phone or, or via your, uh, your computer or whatever is relying upon a binary system, right? Ones and zeros. A quantum computer would be ones and zeros and also one and zero simultaneously and also these various combinations, which makes, as I understand it, basically processing power uh, at, at our current station, it, it would appear to be infinite even yeah. though it, it would not be, but it would appear to be. And also the memory capacity would be, appear to be infinite. So the point at which you read a headline that says, quantum computer makes simulation of Earth. If you ever read that headline, if that ever happens in the, in the course of your life, quantum computer makes realistic simulation of Earth or indistinguishable simulation of Earth. Let's say that. If it's a quantum computer, there's no reason that there couldn't be a thousand simulations of Earth 
And at that point, if there's a thousand simulations of Earth that are indistinguishable from the simulation that we're living in, you have to logically infer the likelihood that you're in the real Earth is pretty low. Right. And so there's a possibility that we're living in, I don't know, a video game or that there's you know, the, the Cato think tank in the real universe just <laughs> runs simulations constantly to go, what would happen if Dan Quayle hadn't been president? <laughs> and that we're, we're living in that, like, turns out a game show host becomes president. That's what happens when Dan Quayle's not president. So that's, that's another possibility. Yeah. I agree. I think the um, I, I obviously you're right. This is this is a subject for another conversation where we have uh, time to expand that that one thing. Um, I I do think that simulation theory or a variant of it is probably the most likely um, explanation for uh, – a creationist version of 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 uh, the universe, mm. by which I do not mean you mean like a, a like young Earth creationist. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you, you yeah. mean there's some intelligence behind. I mean, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, intelligent design is actually what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think intelligent design and simulation theory uh, could very well go hand in hand. Um, whether that's accurate, uh, obviously, I don't know, but uh, I've given it a fair amount of thought, so, so we're, we'll, we're, we'll have to do that at some point. We're approaching the conclusion of the episode. What, so what is your, your final take on the Fermi Paradox? What's, what's your synopsis of this? I'm very glad that, that if what I read is correct, that, that Fermi didn't take this to the to the level that we understand it today, that it was a couple of other people I've never heard of, uh, because... To me, um, and, and we didn't address this, and I'll just I'll very quickly just quickly address it. Uh, to me, it doesn't represent a paradox. It doesn't. It it not only doesn't particularly worry me because I don't think we can wrap our heads around all the different possible scenarios that could explain why we haven't seen life yet. Uh, but also a, a, a paradox itself, the, like the, the the notion of a paradox, is something like uh, if I say to you, "This sentence is false." Wait, so it's a grammar. Grammar is what this boils down to for you. Grammar. You just have a problem with the grammar of it. Uh, like if it was called the Fermi problem, you'd be fine yes, with it. I, well, I'd have a better time with it. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's not a true paradox. I just had this um, image of aliens coming down and going, "We've got a like we we are here to blow away the Fermi paradox." And Josh Jennings <laughs> straddles up and he's like, "It's not a paradox." And like and they're just like, "Yeah, yeah, we got a cure for cancer." And you're like, "Real quick, hold on." Shh. Paradox. Go back means to the that. paradox thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. No. I, so, so as far as I'm concerned, um, what we think of as the Fermi paradox, or I like the Fermi problem better. Yeah. Uh, what we think of as that is is simply a a a failure of human imagination to rise to its full potential, hmm. um, or human imagination uh, a, a failure of human imagination that is insurmountable. It's possible we can't actually conceive of the answer to this because we can't we can't wrap our heads around what's actually out there yeah uh in either case it doesn't really worry me very much um things like things like us destroying ourselves through through some means uh particularly nuclear power uh worries me uh, the heat death of the universe worries me a bit, but obviously I'm not going to be around for it. We should be gone by then, right? we, Probably. Even if we take fish oil supplements, we'll probably <laughs> be gone by then. Um, uh, really quickly, I'll, 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 I'll close out on uh, or, or leave you with a um, brief little story from my youth. When I was a young kid, uh, we went to... Uh, I think it was the Kansas Cosmosphere, and they had this. Is that in Hutchinson, Kansas? It sure is. Where Hutchinson, we have Kansas, listeners. where we have listeners. Shout out to Hutchinson, <laughs> who's greatly outpacing Los Angeles at the moment. Go on, sorry about that. That's fine. Was this whole thing just to plug Hutchinson? It's, we did this entire episode. Nice. That's for just you. For you That's for you, Hutchinson. You're the, welcome. The Hutch. The Hutch. Um, when I so when I was a kid, we went to the Cosmosphere. I remember we looked up. Uh, at the ceiling where they had projected this uh this film uh that was talking about the the universe as we know it and uh at one point they talked about our sun and what it was composed of all of this stuff and they then they said and in five billion years it's going to explode and i remember thinking because i was very very young I remember thinking, oh my God, what if I'm around for that? And I was genuinely terrified. 
And I asked my parents about it, and my parents are creationists, so they're like, God won't let the sun explode. <laughs> right. So <laughs> nice. I felt comforted. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> I'll tell you, my, my, my take on this is, I while I am bothered by a lot of this, I think one of the factors that's generally left out, out of conversations about the Fermi Paradox is, if we're going to talk about the... Uh, the length of our, our galaxy's existence and therefore how old the civilizations are, then you also have to make the assumption that they might have already been here three or four times, right? Oh, of course. So if, if, if alien, let's say civilizations developed three billion years ago, they might have been here 50 times, 50 times with millions of years in between. And they come back and they're like, still dinosaurs. Still no Dairy Queen. Yeah, they, they come back and they're like, <laughs> oh, they're different now. Okay, now they're dinosaurs with like like weird ankle things in the end of their tails but previously they had <laughs> horns like uh right like that like most of human history is not human or most of earth history is not human yeah. so i think that's a distinct possibility and i don't know who who like if, if you have a civilization that intelligent i don't know that they'd establish like a permanent star base on the moon just to see if the algae would eventually congeal into something that could make a good podcast sure. i don't know we may be boring yeah, we. I do not think that for a second. I think that if the interstellar quasi-dimensional Patrick Stewart Bing is listening, he's probably chuckling right now. Probably. And uh, I chuckled throughout. Jennings, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's a good time. All right, let's go do some karaoke. Indeed. Before we leave, let's get some good old-fashioned homo sapien listener feedback off iTunes. Hood29 says, quirky and funny, Heaton stays on topic just the right amount. Thank you very much. You can watch this whole show on YouTube. If you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, you can see my handsome bearded face, an assortment of suits, and the dead bison head we screwed to the wall. Today, you can even feast your eyes upon my lovely producer. And then notice that I am wearing different blazers at the beginning, middle, and end, and then wonder, is Heaton a replicant? Or did they just pre-tape it? You will not be able to determine that. But you'll be able to see what me and Jennings look like, so that'll be nice, right? Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer will only make you seem more sophisticated and amusing at your office or prison cell. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at Facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage on Earth and throughout the galaxy at large, thank you and good day.